you know, this has been in continuous use for more than 800 years. It's quite something, so to, to work out how it's evolved over that time, time span is, is fantastic. My name's Mark Johnston and I am from the Archaeological Practice Limited in Newcastle. And we've been asked by the church here at Alnham to uh, do some archaeological investigation work whilst, uh, whilst there are some major refurbishments here. So on the south wall of the the church nave, there are um, Gothic, early Gothic arches that have been blocked up and nobody has looked at them probably in ooh, 600 years. So they've been removing the blocking material uh, from those and we've made a number of discoveries. We found reused stones in the fabric of the, of the blocking of these arches which are, you know the arches are probably 13th 14th century something like that and we've been finding reused cross slab grave covers which look 12th to 13th century so that's been quite exciting along with lots of other architectural fragments from the early part of the church. It's very rare that you get the opportunity to examine the, the, the fabric of a building to be able to sequence it properly just stare at a building you, you all think it was one one coherent um, built in one coherent uh, time uh, but it's not the case and especially in the borders you get Scottish raids so you get buildings destroyed and rebuilt and then rebuilt again after more raids so it's being able to put the jigsaw together and work out the sequence of the building's life Look here at this one, it's got round, carefully rounded corners. It may be had of a grave slab. This is a grave slab. It has a pair of shears. That was the conventional emblem for a woman. A medieval housewife would have worn a pair of shears, thin kitchen scissors, on her girdle. And they have found shears buried with, uh, in Anglo-Saxon cemeteries with women's graves. But by this time they weren't burying grave goods with you. They were kind of cutting a stone instead. So the most common symbol is the sword. Second most common is the shears.
So all, all interesting stones, but there's a lot more to come out. So yeah, who knows how much we'll get. Chipping away the plasterboard inside a building and seeing um, columns that, you know, 13th century columns that nobody has seen um, for hundreds of years is, is special, really. So it's an interesting story and there are bits of this building that tell you, you know, phase after phase, some very instructive bits. Yes, it's a child skeleton. Um, it's it's only half of it, so it's what we call a partial articulated inhumation. Now, it, it it's it's awkward, but in medieval times there were no regulations in churches as to what depth burials were put in. Um, the, a new law came out in the 1800s, the mid 1800s, where the expression to be buried six foot under comes in where they had to, they insisted they had to be six foot down the problem was that most graveyards in england were absolutely crammed with earlier medieval burials so if you look around churchyards here today like this nearly all of the gravestones are victorian the other way, uh, just like hastily, because what we were getting from here was skull and jaw. Yeah. So what did they do with the medieval burials that would have been just under the surface, like our child skeleton over there? Well, most of them were just dug out and they were either scattered elsewhere in the, in the graveyard or they were buried again, reburied in pits that we call charnel pits which have crammed bones, uh, sometimes many dozens of people thrown into one pit, just to make room. Now the burial over there um, looks like it has been in situ. It could well be a medieval burial in situ, but it has been truncated probably by Victorians who've buried some of their um, graves just next to it and just made room by chopping through the uh, earlier burial. So it's as simple as that, yeah. Child burial, probable medieval origin. But Peter Ryder, who's a, a buildings archeologist, has been looking at the fabric of the, the church building itself, internally and externally. 
Um, so he's been here for a, a couple of weeks looking at that. The arches of a 13th century arcade, there used to be an aisle, um, it got blocked up maybe later medieval, and now the internal faces are being stripped down to reveal the arches, so we can actually see the arches. It's a very nice mode capital, and octagonal appears. So there's one arch has been retained for the north transept. We're opening out two, and a broader western arch. So much has happened, there's a fireplace in there. I think we're leaving that one alone. that you normally just don't see um, very clearly, but these, it's like they've been, uh, they've been uh, carved yesterday, you know, they're fresh. This one is, I think, part of a 12th century corbel from which an arch would have sprung, with this arcade of round it's been arch. blocked up, it's preserved a lot of the material, the columns and the sculpted stones. This is a, um, a small, com almost complete medieval grave slab with a simple straight arm cross We have um, fabulous, um, Mason's marks on all of the stones on the arch. That's probably says you know, maybe Romanesque Norman 12th century. This is part of a medieval grave slab with a with a, uh, the, the shaft of a cross and a knife on it. Can you see the you know, the knife blade and the handle? Uh, incredibly well. It hasn't had any erosion. So. It's steeped in history. The village, uh, much of it is now what we call a, a DMV, deserted medieval village. So it, it's retracted, uh, it's much smaller now than it once was. And these hills now look empty, but once upon a time, from really the, the 17th century maps that we've seen, there were buildings all the way along here, maybe another 80 buildings, something like that. So there, it was a bustling community once upon a time. And, uh, and now is just little more than a hamlet.